Welcome to the Guild Family Stream. Brethren in Christ, laudate to Jesus Christus in sequel love. This is Timothy Flanders at the Meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. This is the Guild Family Stream. This is where we, as an international community, discuss all the most controversial and pressing topics. Today, we're going to be talking about the Dubia Brothers and how the Dubia Brothers are back. And in this broadcast, we will talk about an important aspect, an important example that Pope Francis brings up in his response to the dubia, the responsa ad dubium, and how this, this particular aspect is so controversial that I, I, I think there's almost no one. I, I just saw a tweet from Father Thomas Crean, Crean. It was a couple of weeks ago or months ago where he actually addressed this very issue. And other than that, I really have not seen this important controversial issue raised because it always gets raised. We've seen it raised by John James Martin. We've Now we have Pope Francis raising the same issue. And this issue is so controversial and so unpopular to address this head on, but it's so critical. And that's why I spent so much time in my book addressing this particular issue. But the issue is so controversial, and that will be in the private portion of this broadcast. The first part, as always, will will play place publicly. Um, but it's so difficult to even get through this controversial issue. Uh, so it'll be available for guild members. You can go to meaningofcatholic.com slash register to get the full stream and the full treatment. You can also buy my book, City of God versus City of Man, to delve into that topic. So I will reveal what aspect of that it is in just a minute. Now, um, if if you want to chat in, tell me where you're from, um, and tell me if my audio is, is okay. I've I've had um, issues with my audio on this new mic, so let me know if it's okay or if it's having any problems. Uh, first, we had a question from Forrest Steele, and. Uh, one of our new Gelmers, Welcome Forest, um, and he says this: In your recent article on ultramontanism, so this is this is referring to uh, over at One Peter Five uh, is my article, um, the what is the full spirit of Vatican One, and in this article we're discussing the the changes that were made in the ordinary Catholic culture for ordinary Catholics when the papacy entered into what we might call the encyclical era, the, the concept of, of an encyclical is sort of a new modern concept that the, uh, thank you, agrarian, appreciate that. So we're all, we're all set, good. Um, so the concept of the encyclical is a new modern innovation. Now, innovations are should be a dirty word for Catholics, but sometimes innovations are necessary because the church does have to address new issues, new modern pressing issues that happen, that occur. So it's not necessarily a bad thing that innovations occur, but we need to be cognizant of the causes and effects, sometimes the unintended consequences. And that's what my article is trying to, to try to get at. So um, Forrest says this, quote, he, quoting my article says, these encyclicals are ordinary teaching documents, not responses to specific questions with precise theological notes or censures, end quote. So Forrest then asked this question. Can you please explain the distinction between these two, ordinary teaching and responses to specific questions? If ordinary teaching documents don't have precise theological notes, how do I know what is binding on me to believe and what the church actually teaches? Great question, Forrest, and a very important one. Um, and to... The, the first easy way to answer this question is to say that everything that's in ca contained in every encyclical, we have a duty by the virtue of piety to receive with a submission of mind and will, as, as the, um, the new Professor Fidei says, uh, religious submission of mind and will, uh, which properly understood... Uh, submission needs to be understood more as a religious awe, a religious respect. This is this is something that's very um, it's, it's delineated and explained by uh, Dr. Mike Cirilla over at St. Paul Center. 
at the Emmaus Academy. He is one of the theologians that specializes in the magisterium. And he discusses how submission in English doesn't really quite capture the uh, the duties that we have, religious submission of mind to will. It's more religious awe, religious respect. It's, it's that everything, according to the fourth commandment, everything my father or mother tells me, commands me to do, I should receive with this religious submission, religious awe, religious respect, piety. So everything in any encyclical that any pope says should be received with that attitude. So it's it's sort of starting with an attitude. And so that's the basic thing that we owe to everything in every any encyclical. However, we need to look at the history of the pope's teaching documents. Um the encyclical really we we can um, I mean what we can do here is we can compare Octorum Fidei of Pius VI. We can compare that with Gregory the Sixteenth, and we see a marked difference. If you have a copy of Denziger right here, so here here's Denziger. If you look up Octorum Fidei, and I, I wish I had the text to 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 put up here, but Octorum Fidei has what it does is it it lists so it's responding to a specific situation from the synod of pastoia and actorum fidei lists various things that the synod says and then the pope adds censures to it there are various censures which are added to particular phrases of the synod of pastoia whereas when we get over to gregory the 16th then we start having a long discussion about all different aspects and, and different, uh, this, this is an ordinary teaching document. We're not trying to attach particular censures to particular things. So we're, we've already entered into different territory where it, it's not clear what things in particular he is attaching what theological note to. It's important that we understand what the theological notes are as well. The theological note is the degree of certainty that the ecclesiastical authority gives to a given proposition, which corresponds to the binding obligation thereof. So how do we determine this in an encyclical? Well, it's complicated. If we start with that basic attitude, we've got to have that attitude for everything. But one thing we can quickly, we can quickly uh, distinguish is faith and morals versus not faith and morals. So when the Pope is making comments about particular, well, I mean, the greatest, easiest example here is economics. There are economic moral principles that have to do with faith and morals. Justice, for example. There has to be justice in the economics. And there's basic aspects, very different parts of justice. So these are all in the abstract and the principles. But as soon as the Pope starts talking about the concrete application of those principles, then we've entered in territory that is in some ways beyond his jurisdiction because it is the lay order to apply those principles. The lay order's job is to Christianize society and govern the natural order. And so when the Pope makes a suggestion, you know, the, the most recent uh, document is about climate change. That's a, that is a perfect example of this distinction because the question First of all, the Pope can give moral principles as absolutes regarding the care of the creation. We can, we can, we can take the deposit of faith and teach moral principles that are absolute about the obligation of man to serve and protect and cultivate this garden of the cosmos that he has been given since Adam and Eve. Those are all absolute moral principles. But then when we go to a particular situation where the scientists are debating about all the different aspects and cause and effects of this thing called climate change. Is it, is it global warming or is it climate change? And what exactly, what has caused it? Who, who's to blame? What happened? What government policies should be put in place? All these different things are beyond the Pope's jurisdiction. However, because he has our Holy Father, he certainly has the right to give us his opinion about all those different things. And so we should have an attitude of respect 
and say, Holy Father, thank you for your comments and your suggestions on XYZ PQR that the lay faithful and the scientists and politicians, that's their job to work out and apply. Thank you, Holy Father. We will take those things into consideration when we apply them in our own jurisdiction as lay rulers. So that is should be our attitude towards something like that. And so, but then when we go to faith and morals, what is our binding, if it was it our what is our binding obligation to questions of faith and morals in an encyclical? Well, I'm let me talk about Ordinatio Sacerdotalis because in this document, this is a very relevant document to this very the, the question we're talking about in Dubia, in, in the, the Dubia brothers. This particular document, St. John Paul II says he uses the the Latin phrase we declare. So you he uses the royal we. In fact, let me let me just pull up the pull up the Latin real quick here. Um, so all uh y'all can see it. So because I'm gonna basically what you want to look for in an encyclical is definitive and binding language. Um or denatio sacerdotalis. Um, this is an example of that. This is a great example of that. So um, when we look at the text of, so it's technically an apostolic letter. There's these different terms for all these different teaching documents. Um, and there's different opinions as to what exactly they mean. Um, but there are certainly, especially like in Vatican II, you know, 16 different documents and the dogmatic constitutions are the most authoritative which provide the interpretive key for all the others. Um, but this, here's an example of, so it's an apostolic letter and it talks for a while about different aspects. And then it goes down here and it says this. So first of all, declaramos, we declare. That's a we, it's a royal we, it's a plural. In the English translation, it says, I declare, that's not true. In Latin, it's we declare. Uh, so we declare that the church does not have the faculty to ordain, uh, to confer sacra sacerdotal uh, ordination upon uh, women. Now, this is the key phrase here. Honk sententiam. That is this proposition, this proposal, this thing, this doctrine. And sententiam refers to a particular proposition that's sort of under dispute. And it says, it is necessary that all the faithful of the church must hold this definitive. This is the key phrase right here, definitive. It's definitive. And that is the very nature of infallibility and dogmatic clarity. It's something that is definitive. So definitive means that there was a question priorly, prior to this, there was some doubt. In fact, he, he mentions doubt. Ut iditur omne dubium afferetur. So for the sake of removing all dubium, every there, we're going to take away all the doubt. So the intention here, this is the clear intention of this document, is to remove all doubt. What is the doubt? Whether or not the church can confer sacramental ordination on women. Therefore, we've, re we've removed it by using the, ter the term definitive. So the nature of the a doubt, there's a question. Now we've closed the door because it's definitive. It's, it's the, the, answer, the question has been answered. Roma locuta est, causa finita est. Rome has spoken, the matter is closed. That's what the what that's what definitive means. It's definitive. It's infallible. Now, there is some dispute among theologians as to it is this this decision is infallible by what mood? Mode. Some theologians say that, like John Joy uh, published this at 1 Peter 5. Some theologians say that it was infallible by the mode of this very document. Others say that it's infallible by the mode of the ordinary universal magisterium, and this document merely witnessed to that. 
But in either case, it is infallible and should be held definitively. And that is, so this, so the answer to your question here is you look for definitive language. What is being spoken of definitively? Um, there is similar language in Dominus Jesus, although technically I'm not sure if that was approved in the right way to be a dogmatic infallible pronouncement. Um, there, the theologians dispute this to a degree, but when we look at the language, the way in which it is binding, this is what Lumen Gentium in the appendix at the very end of Lumen Gentium, it says, Lumen Gentium says that this council, Vatican II, defines what is binding, only what is manifestly binding. The same is true of Vatican I. You can, you can read through Vatican I, and then when you get to the anathemas, those are the definitively binding things in those ways. And we're going to talk about one of those anathemas in just a minute uh, in our private guild portion. And that's why uh, those aspects of those things are so important. So I hope that gives some clarity. Um, but bottom line is if you're confused by encyclicals, it's best to just focus on reading the definitive and approved catechisms the um, catechisms that has been passed down. In fact, I just got my new copy of Tradivox. This is a, a great thing to subscribe to or just read the, um, the Catechism of the Council of Trent. But this is um, the next in a series, Tradivox. So this is the next of, of Tradivox. These are all the traditional catechisms. And uh, Bishop Schneider just released his own catechism as well. So that's out. I would start with the catechisms just to get some basics. And then encyclicals later, after you've digested all these catechisms, um, the fundamentals of, of Catholic dogma by Ludwig Ott is also very helpful. Um, the, the fact is that the encyclicals, a lot of them, especially the older ones, were addressed to bishops in particular. And so it's already assumed that the bishops already have this catechetical formation. So there's a certain, I think encyclicals sort of assume that you already have this catechetical formation. You've got all this dogmatic stuff. And so you can then read through these things. And unfortunately, Vatican II sort of assumed that, um, but that's another story. So with that, in just a minute, we're going to get into those controversial aspects that I just talked about. The one thing that we need to talk about, but we can't talk about uh, publicly and so that'll be, we'll be back in just a minute to get into all those topics. So if you want to want the full stream, meaningofcatholic.com slash register. We also br brought up the fact that um, it's important to know Latin. So you can go to meaningofcatholic.com slash academy. And we have, um, we're just starting out our Latin and Greek study groups. Um, right now it just says the Latin classes, but you can sign up for those and contact us for more information. meaningofcatholic.com slash register. Oh. 